All right. Kind of a long chapter. We start in Genesis chapter 31, but uh, it's, it's a great story. And what we see here, of course, is the story of Jacob when he finally leaves Laban, right? He goes, he's sent out after he, he has a fight with his brother when he steals the blessing. And um, he goes out to find a wife. He ends up finding um, Leah and Rachel, and he goes in and works for Laban to, to pay the dowry seven years for each wife. And, it, you know, and there's that whole story. You, you know all that. We're not going to get into all the history of everything that happened there. And then he worked another six years. So basically he ends up working like 20 years for Laban before he finally is just called out where God's telling him, hey, go back into the land of your fathers. Go back into the land of Canaan. And, you know, he's got more work for, for Jacob to do elsewhere and he wants him to leave. And what we see in this story, and, and we're going to turn to many other places, but um, what, what I'm going to be preaching about this evening is working for the Lord and, and having a good work ethic and being able to be a, a man or a person of integrity and someone who's going to get a job done and who's going to work regardless of how you're treated either by your employer or by whatever position you are where you're subservient to someone else that you can still do the job that you need to get done regardless of the outside influences or how well you're being treated or poorly you're being treated or anything like that. And, and you know, this is really lacking today in society is this, um, this lack of character and integrity, especially among the youth, where we get more and more into this entitlement type of attitude where people just think the world owes them this and that and everyone thinks, well, of course I should have a cell phone and of course I should have two cars and this house and all this stuff. And people just thinking like, it's me, 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 me. You Give me free education. Give me free health care. Give me all of this stuff because I deserve it. And it's wickedness. And people these days, we got the snowflakes these days that don't want to lift a finger to do any type of hard work and, and, and do anything that's going to cause them to break a sweat or, or someone might treat them kind of roughly. You're going to cry about it and go to social media and go get some petition to sign or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's nuts. It's insane. And you know what? They're never going to succeed. And, and, and it, with enough people in that type of mindset, it's going to destroy the, the country. I mean, there's so many things destroying it. But God's people ought not to be like that, though. And we're going to get an example from God's people. This is a great example. This, this story with Jacob is a great example. First of all, just wrap your mind around working for someone for 20 years. That in and of itself is a long, a long time. Some people may have experiences like, oh man, I had this really bad job once and I worked there for like a year, right? And then you moved on because you didn't like that job or whatever. And look, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with switching jobs because you're not at a good job or whatever. It's, that, that's not a sin. It's not what I'm saying. But to be a worker like Jacob and to do what's right, regardless of the situation that, that he's in with his employer, with an unsaved employer, by the way, you know, I don't, I don't think that everyone, you know, once you're saved, you just have to go find someone else who's saved to work for. I, I don't think the scripture teaches that. I mean, it would be great if you could, but, you know, everyone needs to, you know, all men need to provide for their families. You need to work somewhere and you're going to need to find a job and you're going to need to work hard in order to do that. But what we're going to see and what we're going to see from these passages is that you may work for a wicked person. You may invest a lot of time. You may not be compensated properly for, what, for the work that you're doing. But if you can stay the course, if you can keep your integrity, if you can work hard, God will bless you for it. God will make sure that you're taken care of in the long run. But see, what we've got to understand about God as well is that he doesn't deal always in the short term, right? In the, oh, hey, God, I did something good today. Now give me some great blessing. There's the concept of sowing and reaping. And that is a very, very, very important truth and concept to understand and to keep with us that when you sow, I don't care what you're sowing, any seed on this earth, when you're sowing something, you are not going to reap from that sowing the next day. It takes time. Likewise with God, with the things that we do, with the good that we do, we just need to keep doing good 
and doing it by faith because you know that in the end, it'll come back and you'll be able to reap and you'll be able to have a harvest. In Jacob's case, in this one situation, it's 20 years. 20 years. Let's look at, let's reread a little piece, you know, portion of this, this passage here. I know we all read the whole chapter, but we're going to focus in here on verse number 36 because Jacob just kind of, after Laban comes and he's like, you stole my gods, you know, and, and he's all angry because he left with his wives and children and all this other stuff. And then Jacob gets upset. He gets mad because he's, he's finally leaving. He's, he's fed up. He's had it. And God called him out. God called him away from, from working for Laban anymore to do something else. And um, we're going to see here in verse number 36, it says, And Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge betwixt us both. He said, what did I do? I didn't steal anything from you. Just lay it all out on the table right now and, and show me what I did wrong. Why are you coming after me like this? And then he continues, verse 38. This 20 years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. He said, I haven't ever taken anything from you. And this is a good testimony because he has never, you know, he could boldly say, what did I ever take from you? Because he never took anything. And we ought to be able to have enough character to be able to boldly say to our employers or whoever we're working for, hey, where did I ever do you wrong? When did I ever steal from you? When did I ever take from you? I always did that which was right to you. Because this is a very strong position to be in morally and righteously to be able to say, hey, I did everything right. You cannot come after me for doing anything because I never did anything wrong. Let's keep going because we see the conditions that he was working under during these 20 years. Verse 39, that which was torn of beasts, I brought not unto thee. So while he's watching the flocks, when other predators come in, wolf comes in or any, you know, any predator comes and maybe destroys some animal in the flock, it's not always the, the fault of the person who's watching when those things happen. I mean, those things happen naturally. There's going to be some element of loss when it comes to watching over herds and cattle flock like that because of predators. And, he's say, and what he's saying, though, is that when that happened, when there was a loss, I didn't bring that to you. I didn't say, hey, Laban, you lost one of these, you know, one of these animals. He says, I bear the loss of it. He took responsibility. He said, you know what? It's my fault. It's, it's, it's my responsibility. He never brought anything to Laban under his watch. He said, fine, you know, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand, it's thou require it. So even Laban was the one saying, no, you, you're responsible for that, so I'm not paying you, you know, whatever. You know, it's coming out of your paycheck. Any loss that there is. And then he says, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Now, the Bible talks about, you know, the difference between something being stolen in the daytime and stolen at nighttime. I mean, if, something, if you're watching something for someone else and it's stolen at night, there is no recompense for that. There is no, you know, if you were to go to court or go to the judges, they wouldn't rule that, oh, you owe this person anything. As long as you weren't conniving and, you know, and, and setting it up to, to steal your employer's stuff. If it was stolen by night, the, God's law, God's righteous law basically just said, well, you know, those things happen and, and that the person who was responsible doesn't have to pay that back because, because of what happened to it. And so, and you could go in and look at the law for that, but um, again, it's, it's a little bit outside of the scope of what I want to deal with tonight. We're just seeing this list of the, these various things, the way that he worked for him. Verse number 40 says, thus I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night in my sleep departed from my eyes. So he was working hard. He was out in the, in the land by day, by night, in the heat of the day, in the cold freezing of the night, not being able to sleep. He is working for 20 years very hard for Laban and not quitting and not crying about it. And I'll guarantee you, you know, he was getting sick. I bet you he was still going out there and working. I bet you still watched over the flock and still did the job that he was supposed to do. And through all of this, look at verse number 41. 
Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages 10 times. So in the midst of all this, in all this hard work, he's got a boss that's just changing his wages on him. They agree on one thing, and then it's, oh, no, no, okay, well, actually, I'm just going to give you this. And, and it's just constantly being ripped off is what he's saying here. You've been ripping me off for 20 years. Going back to the very beginning when he was promised Rachel and he was given Leah. But then he still put in the work for him, and then he still worked even more for cattle, and he's still just getting wages changed on him. 20 years, he finally decides to leave, but the whole time he wasn't crying about it. He still did his job. He still worked hard. Verse number 42, he says, Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me away now empty. He says, I'm confident that if I wanted to leave, you would have just taken everything and just shoved me out the door, and I wouldn't have gotten anything for my work for you. Because that's the type of man that Laban was but that's not the type of man that Jacob was. He says, God hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesterday. And he said, God saw my work. God saw that I was true. God saw my character and, and my righteousness in how hard I worked. And we need to make sure as believers, as Christians, that we can have the same type of dedication, the same type of hard work regardless of the circumstance. Men, you need to work for your boss as if you work for Christ. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Even if your boss doesn't respect you, even if your boss talks down to you, the attitude that you have should be one of a hard worker. If you are employed to do a job, then you do that job to the best of your ability. If your job is scrubbing toilets, hey, you make sure that toilet gets really clean. If your it doesn't matter what the job is. If you're being employed to do a job, if you're going to be righteous, then you need to be working hard, whatever that may be. At, at my previous job, I was, you know, I was... Um, employed initially in the shipping department and there was a lot of just office maintenance and things you got to take out the trash and stuff and there were some people that would say oh well you have a call you know like like i have a college degree so i'm not going to do this stuff i'll tell you what that attitude is going to get you nowhere nowhere what you ought to be like is hey what else can i do don't let that that piece of paper or these credentials just lift up your head into the clouds saying, well, I'm too good for this work. Because I'll tell you right now, I have a college degree. I have a Bachelor of Science. It really doesn't mean that much. And if I need to work to support my family, you better believe I'm going to work whatever it's going to take. Amen. And I'm going to work hard at it. Because you know what? The hard workers are going to be the ones that get promoted anyways. The ones that think they're too good for work, bosses don't like that. And if anyone's ever been in a position of being a manager or being a boss over people, you know who you, want, who, who you can see excelling. They're going to be the ones getting the promotions. It will work out for you. I mean, it naturally works out for you. And the concept of sowing and reaping is as true as a day is long. And it will work. Now, you may have to work hard for a long time, before you really see a lot of that investment, before you really see the fruits of your labor, but you have to work by faith, knowing that if I just keep the, the path and keep the course, it will work out. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm not saying that you'll just get millions of dollars and you'll just have all of this stuff if you work hard. But you know what? God will make things right that are right. God will make sure you're provided for and God will make sure that things are done. And here's the bottom line is that even if you don't ever receive the financial compensation that maybe you're working for, because we know how good God is and because we know that he sees everything and he's a God of justice, he'll make that right for you. And if it's not done in this world, guess what? In the next world, it will be. Just seeing the testimony that you can have as a hardworking person. God will reward you for that. 
Turn if you, I have you turn to Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Everything that we do, it says in word, things that you say, or in deed, in your actions, in what you do. Let's do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're doing something where you're embarrassed or ashamed to be doing in the name of the Lord Jesus, then maybe you ought not to be doing those things. If you've got a job or if you're talking to people and something that you're saying is you can't say, you know, uh, you know praise Jesus or put, put his stamp of approval on that and doing it and say, hey, and all this thing I'm saying, I'm saying in the Lord Jesus. If you're, if you're not meeting that criteria, then maybe you ought not to be doing those things or saying those things. We ought to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus and giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above from the Father of lights. And that, you know, whatever job that you have or whatever work that you have to do, we ought to be thankful for that work. We ought to be thankful for what God has decided to give you. And don't have a bad attitude and don't get bitter about it and don't, don't be affected by the attitude that has been creeping into our society for way too long. And this entitlement nonsense. Continuing on here in Colossians 3, verse number 18, and this is very important too. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So up to this point, I've been talking mostly, mostly to men or people who would be in the workforce and working for somebody. But as a wife, you know what? You're working for someone too. You're working for your husband. The husband is the head of the household. God has put the man in charge at the home, that he is the boss. So a wife is, is in, the, in essence, working for her husband. And this is something that you need to be able, if you're going to be right, and see, the, the, what I really want to emphasize tonight and, and what I really want you to go walk away with is you doing what's right regardless of how other people are treating you. So you could say, well, my boss is bad, right? And try to put the blame off on them and play this blame game of blaming everyone else. And a wife saying, well, I'm not going to do my job because my husband is a jerk. My husband's real mean or my husband's not saved. Right? You, could, you could continually give all of these different reasons, all these different excuses why you shouldn't be working hard at your job. But that's all they are is just empty excuses. If we are going to be Christ-like, and we're going to see that here in a minute in this passage, if we are going to do what we're supposed to do, we, we cannot be consumed with what other people do around us. We need to just make sure that our role, our job is being done to the best of our ability and God will deal with the rest. We're going to get into the wives in just a minute. We're going to keep reading this passage. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So many different roles here have people of a position of authority over you. You know, children, you may not be working a job because you're too young. You're not out working, but you know what? You have parents. So you need to take it upon yourself to be the best child that you can be, that you can be obedient unto your parents and do whatever it is that they have for you to do without complaining, without murmuring, without anything else, and, and being the best child that you can be. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Verse 22, servants, so this is a worker, someone who's working for someone else, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Being a servant. And it says according to the flesh, right? You have a master according to the flesh. You have a boss. You have someone telling you what to do. He says you need to serve. You need to obey. And not just when the boss is looking. Because that's just an eye pleaser. That's just someone who, oh, hey, wait, the boss is coming. Like, pick up some, you know, start looking real busy. And then he walks away and you just go back to just lounging, playing on your phone or whatever. Look, people do that all the time. And it's wicked. 
That is not the way we ought to be because the Bible is saying that we need to do this in singleness of heart, fearing God. Because if you are working with an attitude that whether the boss is here and present or not, God's seeing what I'm doing all the time anyways. So if I'm just screwing off and not getting anything done and not doing any work, God sees that even if your boss doesn't see that. Right. And you will reap what you sow because God will make sure that that, happen, that happens. Verse 23, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, with your heart, sincerely, as to the Lord and not unto men. Your attitude when serving ought to be as if, hey, I'm working, Jesus Christ is my boss. So whatever your boss is telling you to do, outside of sinning, of course, so whatever your boss is telling you to do, just at a, at a job, we really ought to have this attitude of like, hey, Jesus Christ just told me to go and do this, do this work. So how hard would you work if Jesus was the one telling you to do something as opposed to some other man? And that's the way that we need to have the mindset. And like I said, it may be hard to do that. And some of the things we'll be talking about tonight, it may be hard. And that's why I'm bringing it up because a lot of these things are hard to deal with. It's, it may be hard to swallow your pride. It may be hard to humble yourself. It may be hard to not just want to blow off your boss because he really doesn't treat you well at all. And he's just, he really is a big jerk. But it's what we're supposed to do, and it's what we're called to do, and it's what the Bible says that we need to do if we're going to be right with God. And as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we live in a great, uh, in a very blessed society. There are plenty of jobs out there. You don't have to stay with one job, but whatever job you have, you ought to be working your hardest and your best for whoever that is. If someone's not treating you right. Go ahead and leave. Great. But just make sure that wherever you end up, and even until you find another job or whatever, just keep working. Keep working hard. Verse number, um, let's reread verse number 23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So right there, there's a promise of saying, hey, you're serving God, so you, he's going to give you the reward. He's going to recompense you, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. O saved person, child of God, hey, if you're doing wrong, you're going to receive for the wrong that you're doing too. There's no, there's no respect of persons there. God will make sure that, that you're dealt with appropriately. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 3. I told you we are going to get into this in a little bit about the, about the wives. We saw the great example of Jacob and how hard he worked and, and, the, and the sweat that he put in and, and the, the conditions he dealt with, but still worked very hard. We're going to talk to the wives for a little bit of how they ought to work even if they, they don't have a good husband. It's great. It's a lot easier to respect your husband to be obedient to your husband, to submit to your husband when you have a great husband, when they're leading really well, when they are the spiritual leader in the house, when, when you, you do have that respect for them. It, it's, it's a lot easier to do it then. And it's a lot harder and it's way more difficult if your husband's lazy, if he's not providing as he ought to be, if he's not filling his role, it makes things way, way, way harder. And, you know, and I feel bad for some of the ladies because unfortunately they are married to, to, to lazy guys. And they do have this uphill battle to try to keep themselves submissive when their husband's sending them off to work and sending them off to get the paycheck because they're too lazy to get off the rear end and get the job done. However, their job and their role doesn't change in God's eyes. Just because one person isn't filling their, their proper responsibility, yours doesn't change. So it may be harder, but again, this is why we're talking about this. Let's go to Scripture and see what the Bible says about how we deal with these things. Look at verse number three, or excuse me, verse number one of 1 Peter chapter three. The Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, talk about the word of God, anyone obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, 
That may or may not be talking about the husbands, and I actually think that it's not necessarily talking about husbands. It's probably talking about other wives not, um, not obeying the word. However, the, the point that's being put forward here is that your actions speak much louder than words. So when you can be in a situation where, hey, you're supposed to be submissive, you're supposed to have you know, all this stuff done, and maybe it's harder for you, but you still continue to do your job, other people will see that and other people will notice that. And I'll tell you what, even husbands, let's say, let's say your husband is failing in an area and not being a good leader or not treating you well or not, you know, whatever the case may be, if they, when they see you still being a godly woman and doing to you know, the best of your ability what God is telling you to do, that will make an impact with them. Maybe you have a husband that's not saved. Maybe, you know, there's people in all kinds of different situations. A husband whose heart has been kind of hardened to some things. But they see their Christian wife just doing good day in, day out, and working and serving very hard and following Proverbs 31 and trying to be that virtuous woman the, the, the years and years and years of service of the, of the woman just acting faithfully, not seeing the results of their efforts right away, not getting irritated because, oh man, I worked really hard today, I got up early, I did all this stuff, and my husband just blew me off. So forget all this. And just giving up on it after a very short period of time instead of following through by faith and living the role that, you, that God has called you to do. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Your actions will speak very loud. And when people see the hardworking Christian, that's going to give the good testimony, you know, the, the man that's out on the job. You know, people know that you're, that you're a believer and that you're not only a believer, you're a zealous believer. You go to a fundamental Baptist church and you go out and preach the gospel and you're trying to get people saved and show them the truth. But then you're just lazy on the job and everyone knows it. Why would anyone want to listen to you? Why? They say, who's this guy? You know, I... But your testimony will go a long way. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to see this passage about, um, you know, still, still going on with the husband and wife uh, teaching here. And the good that can come out of a wife doing their job, even in a bad, maybe a bad situation where the husband isn't doing good. Because like I said before, if, if everyone's in their role and everything's going great, you don't, you don't need the encouragement. You don't need the teaching. Everything's going well. There's no problem, right? It's, it's, it's the, difficult problem, or the difficult areas that we have problems with. Verse number 12 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Bible says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So all about one spouse being saved and the other one not. He's saying, don't, don't get divorced. Don't leave them. Right? Don't, you know, just stay together. Verse number 14, why? For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Verse 15, but if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. cases excuse me. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife? Verse 16. Whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And see, people get in these situations sometimes where maybe both people are unsaved and then one gets saved later on, right? And now it's caused a strain in the relationship and there's problems because one wants to serve God and the other one's not saved. But if you can endure, if you can go with it, if you can live to your role and be the best husband or the best wife that you can be, that may speak volumes, especially to someone who, I mean, you got married, you probably felt you knew pretty well, the, the, your, your action, and especially a change of action and, and doing even more, ought to speak volumes to that person. Instead of just saying, well, I'm just going to leave because... He doesn't want to serve God. You say, no, I'm going to stick with this because how do I know? Maybe I'll end up getting my husband saved or I'll end up getting my wife saved as a result because I'm going to fill my role that God told me to fill. And those actions can speak a lot of uh, uh, volumes. Look at verse number 20. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. 
But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now the reason why I'm going over this is because you know, the first half of my sermon, I really wanted to talk a lot about um, the, the work physically, like in this world, just working at a job or working at home, you know, applying it to men, to women, wherever your, your, your position may be, and just working hard there. But there's, there's more work to be done when we're working for the Lord, obviously, and that's working for spiritual things. And the Bible says here, hey, you're bought with a price. We are bought. Jesus Christ's blood paid for our souls, paid for our salvation. We're bought with a, with a, with a very high price. We ought not to then just be the servants of men. And he's not talking about, you know, providing for your family. He's talking about just, you know, earthly things and just being servants of men. We know we need to be, we're bought by the Lord. Let's work for the Lord. Let's serve him. Turn if you to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter number 8. Joseph in the book of Genesis is a great example of someone who endured a lot of affliction and a lot of hard times and was not put in a good situation, but he endured. He was patient and he continued to do what was right regardless of his circumstances, regardless of his situation. Joseph could have had a very bad attitude. For one, after his, his own brothers sold him to be a slave in Egypt, right? Right off the bat, oh, I got, I've got a bad childhood. Nobody likes me in my family, you know, except my dad, but my brothers all hate me. They sold me into Egypt. My dad thinks I'm dead. What good is this anymore? Now I'm just some slave. He could have given up. He could have just said, well, if I'm a slave, then I'm going to act like a slave. I'm going to, you know, get off into whatever because I'm bitter, because I'm angry, because this shouldn't have happened to me. But that's not the attitude Joseph had. And then he could have had that attitude afterwards, after he got in, he was sold in slavery. He'd say, okay, but he's got a pretty decent position until he was lied about. There was a false witness against him and he was thrown into the dungeon. And then you can say, oh man, well, I'm, I'm thrown in here. I don't even belong in here. Another opportunity to just lose his character, to lose his integrity, to say, well, forget it. If, I'm gonna, if they're going to call me a criminal, I'm going to be a criminal. People get that attitude. But Joseph didn't give up. He continued to serve the Lord until eventually, after how many decades, he's at the top. He's ruling Egypt. Pharaoh was greater than him in name only. Why? Because he stuck with it. Because in everything that he did, he had the attitude of, I'm serving the Lord. I'm not just serving man. I'm serving the Lord. In everything. He endured with patience. Look at Romans 8, verse number 25. The Bible says, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So we're hoping for things. When, when we're working in our life, when we're going through a routine and we're working for whoever we work for, we're hoping for the things that we can't see. That's what faith is. We know, we know what the Bible says. We know that we're supposed to be working hard, but we don't see it. And you're not gonna see, you, you know you're not going to see the results, at least not for a while. But then that's where patience comes in. We, with patience, wait for it. Verse number 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, people like to take this verse out of, out of context and misapply it, but it's not saying that all things work together for good just to those that are saved, but to those that love God. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if you want things to be going well for you and, and things that end up working for good in the end, not always immediately, but in the end, 
then you're going to, if you love God, it will happen. When you're, when you're keeping his commandments, when you have the right attitude, when you're working hard and still staying the course, as Joseph did, he stayed the course. All things ended up working out for good for Joseph. Now, it wasn't always good in the middle, in the earlier stages. That's where faith comes in. That's why we have to have faith. That's why we have the hope. That's what it's there for, and, and that's what is supposed to keep us going. So when you have the difficult times, we have these great examples in the Bible, people to look to. Think about Joseph. Think about Jacob. Think about Job. Think about the things that these people went through and look at how God dealt with them in the end so that nothing that you can be going through or you could be enduring, don't let that change how you act. The things that you do, don't let that dissuade you from serving the Lord, but maintain the focus and maintain the integrity that you ought to have in your service because all things will work together for good. As long as you love God, you're keeping his commandments, you're doing what's right, it will work for good. Verse number 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? More great encouraging words that... Whatever your, your situation is, knowing that God is the revenger, that God's the one, a God of justice, any situation that you find yourself in, when you do right, who could really be against you? Because God is for you. Turn, if you would, to um, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 25. Now, I do believe that hard work does pay off in this lifetime, just in general. When people are working really hard, the harder you work, you're, you, you will, to some level, to some degree, you know, have some type of monetary or financial success or something like that. It's the way things work. When people are really hard workers, that, that's just what happens. But just because that, do, that is true doesn't mean that that's where our focus should be. Now, we should be working hard because we're working for the Lord, not because we're just seeking after all kinds of riches and money that's going to fail. We covered some of that this morning. But we work hard because that's what God told us to be. That's how, that's how we ought to be in God's eyes, regardless of whatever comes as a result. If we get blessed financially, great. Real praise God. But that's not what, we're, what we should be focused on. We should be focused on receiving the eternal rewards of being a hard worker for our Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, our attitude of being able to endure applies not only to those carnal things, like, like a job or you know, putting up maybe with a, with a bad spouse, but more importantly to, to the spiritual things. And in Proverbs, I'm going to read this for you, Proverbs 11, verse 18 says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. A sure reward. You're sowing righteousness. You're doing what's right. There is a sure reward, reward for that from the Lord. Proverbs 25, look at verse number 21. And again, this is, this is where it can be difficult. This is where we have the challenge in life of doing the right thing. The Bible says, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. That's not always easy to do when someone's your enemy, someone hates you, to do good unto them. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. There is a reward for that. So even if it's something that may be hard for you to do or to think about doing, we need to have the faith to know, hey, well, God is going to take care of this, and God's going to reward me. And this specifically, when you're doing good to your enemy, <laughs> Jesus did good to his enemies. You think about the life that Christ led. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus did good to, to people who, who treated him poorly and, and mocked him and ridiculed and spit on him and beat him up. He, treated, he did good to them. He continued to go to the cross and pay for everyone's sins. 
That's the example that we need to be able to follow. But in so doing, now think about this. That with the sacrifice and the love that Jesus Christ had and he gave for us, it makes sense that God has this punishment of hell for people who reject that. You know, the Jehovah's false witnesses and, and other people who don't want to believe in a literal fiery hell. Oh, how could a God, you know, God's love, how could a loving God send people to this place? Well, it's actually not that hard when Jesus gave so much love to enemies, to people that did hate them, and offered up salvation for free. W what else is left when they reject that? Of course there's going to be anger and wrath and fury and, and punishment when everything is given to you when you don't even deserve this and I'm still going to give this to you and I'm still going to go through everything for you and you reject it. There's a punishment for that. And in, in a similar manner, when we have people who hate on us and they're our enemies, because of our, especially because of our beliefs, but we just do good to them, we're overcoming that evil with good. God sees that. And when they continue to just be bad to you and do bad things, you know what? That makes God angry because they have no place to be doing that to you. And God's a God of justice. And when he sees that, he says, they're doing good to you. And here you go, you know, persecuting and, and, and everything else. And that's why the Bible said in Proverbs, you're going to heap coals of fire on their head because God will make it right. But we have to live by the example that Christ gave us. We're just saying, hey, someone hates you? You need to overcome that. You need to be able to deal with that with love and just say, you know, well, I'm going to feed you. My enemy's hungry, I'll feed him. Thirsty, I'm going to give him water. And I'll let God deal with the rest. Because you know what? Maybe God, maybe they don't have to have coals of fire leaped on their head. Maybe they can look at that and finally you know, those actions will pierce through a cold, stony heart. And they'll see, what am I doing? This doesn't make any sense. They're still being good to me. Now, don't go thinking I'm, a, I'm just this total lifestyle evangelism person because we believe in, in, in soul winning and door-to-door -door knocking. But, the, I mean, just because there's people who only want to get people saved based on their lifestyle doesn't mean that there isn't a place for you having a good testimony based on your lifestyle. Just because that's all they ever want to do anything and they don't want to go out and do the work doesn't make that completely false of saying, hey, someone can look at your life. Someone... It, it, it will have a good influence or a good impact on them. They're just completely lacking in a, in a very important area. But both are important. We ought to have the entire, you know, I, I was saved, you know, 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. And for the longest time, I wasn't preaching the gospel to anybody. I knew what it took to be saved. I could have, I could have tried to give people the gospel. The reason why I didn't is because I was in sin and I was living a lifestyle that I knew People will just look at me and say, well, you're just a big hypocrite. Why should I listen to you? And it's true. Because I would look at someone the same way. Especially back then. I said, why should I listen to you? What good is this? Do you, you really believe that? Doesn't look like you believe it to me. All the more reason why it's so important for us to, to, to fight the good fight in our own lives and, and, to, and to try to live as righteously as we can. To have that testimony, you're in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11. The Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. It's a blessing. It may not feel like a blessing when people are reviling you, they're persecuting you, they're making lies about you, they're spreading rumors about you, they're gossiping about you. But the Bible says, you know what, that's actually a blessing. These verses are great because of all the things that we can deal with, that we have to deal with in our life just in general, in the, in the down times that we have, the times where things are not going well, we have Scripture here, God's Word, to help lift us up, to edify us, and to give us the proper perspective on everything that might go wrong in our life in this world. On everything. So we don't have to give up hope. We don't have to be hopeless. We don't have to get completely depressed. 
anything negative that happens in our life, well, there's scripture in there saying, am I in sin? Do I need to get rid Am I being chastened by God? And the Bible even says, hey, if you're being chastened, you could still be happy about that because the Lord loveth every son. You know, he chastens every son who he receiveth. And if he's chastening you, he loves you. Right. If you're receiving discipline, you can at least take comfort in the fact, God loves me. Because if he didn't love me, he would let me continue down the wrong path. But then if you're being persecuted or going through hard times for something that you didn't do, it's not a result of your own sin, then we could still have the, the comfort of knowing, hey, if it's because I'm doing right, then I'm blessed. Because now I have a reward. Verse 12 says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Any downtime in your life, you can receive the encouragement and the strength to continue forward through God's word. We just need to know where to find it. You just need to be looking. And if you're reading every day, you ought to be able to know where to find it. Or you're gonna, you should be able to get to the point to where you're able to find it. And these things ought to be in your heart. That's why it's so important. You know, it teaches all the time. Read the Bible for yourself. It's not enough to just come to church once, twice, or even three times a week and that is all the nourishment you're getting. You need to be in this word regularly because here's what happens. You'll hear a sermon like this, similar to this, preached once, you hear it, but then like years down the road, you come into some problem where this sermon could help, but it's already out of your mind. And if you're not in the scriptures and just seeing this stuff and being reinforced with God's word on a regular basis, then it's not going to end up really doing you any good. But if, it, if, it's, if it's refreshed, if it's renewed, see, hopefully the, the goal and the point of a lot of the, the preaching and the sermons is that you're going to be hearing truths preached. We're going to many passages in the Bible, and then in your own personal Bible reading, you're going to be remembering, oh, yeah, oh, I remember when this sermon was, oh, I remember this truth. Oh, I, you know, here it is. And, and, and it's just being refreshed in your mind as you're seeing these things in God's Word and then picking up so much more. Jump down to verse number 43 there in Matthew chapter 5. It's, it's amazing how much we can be joyful for even during bad times. The Bible says in verse 43, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And again, just, just reiterating basically the same concept of receiving rewards from God by you doing what's right, regardless of how people treat you. If people do well to you, you do well to them. If people do evil to you, you still do well to them because we are supposed to do good and not evil. And even what they're saying here, it's, it's easy to do well to people when they do well to you. Of course it is. It's hard to do well to people when they don't do well to you. And that's where we need to shine forth. That's where we need to show ourselves children of God. That's where we need to make whatever changes in our life and, and to remember this and to humble ourselves to, to have this type of, a, of an attitude. And if you can do that, and if you can endure and if you can just, just get through the afflictions and persecutions, God has a reward for you in heaven that you're never going to lose. It's eternal. Moth and rust doesn't corrupt. It is yours and it's secure. I'll read this for you. And uh, you could turn, if you would, to... Um, I'm going to skip over. So I've got so much content here. We're not going to get to all of it. So if you were to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll just read for you a couple passages, the parallel passage, what we saw in Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes. In Luke chapter 6 says in verse 35, But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. 
saying, you're going to have a great reward in heaven, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. The Bible's saying that's how you show yourself to be a child of God, because he is also kind to the unthankful and evil, as Jesus was. Now, there is going to be a judgment and a punishment for them, but on this earth, the, you know, the unthankful, evil people, hey, the rain still comes down. They still end up receiving a blessing from God. And um, we need to behave ourselves in the same way that we see God the Father um, behaving himself. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. And God is merciful even to unbelievers in this earth. He is. He's very merciful. I know I, he was merciful to me as an unbeliever before I put my faith in Christ. Just think of all the things that I'd done that I didn't deserve any mercy, yet he still was, even though I wasn't even his child yet. God is very merciful. We need to keep that in mind, too, especially, and this is, this is a pitfall that people that, that really believe and have a zeal for God's word can fall into is the self-righteous attitude where you really start looking down on other people and not being merciful and scoffing at people. Oh, you don't know this and you don't know that and then having just this really, really bad attitude as opposed to having the, the humble and meek spirit and, and being merciful uh, as, as God is merciful. Now, um, yeah, I'm going to skip that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Working for the Lord requires humility and patience. We need to be Christ-like. Every, I mean, just think about all the things that Jesus Christ went through. Especially around the time of his crucifixion. I mean, people, people were constantly conniving and trying to arrest him and get him put to death. Yet he still continued doing good. And up to the time of his, his arrest, he, he still humbled himself. He endured the afflictions. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He, they spit on him. His own, his own disciple, one of his own, completely rejected him. Total traitor. Someone who had his confidence. Someone who was put in a good position. Just stabbed him in the back. And, and, and gave him up to be delivered unto death. He had people lying about him, bringing false witness. Yet he still stayed the course. I mean, many people didn't even appreciate him. Think about the people that he healed and they didn't, even, they didn't even go back and thank him. Like the lepers that were telling you, only one person comes back to even give him thanks. Jesus could have been like, look, I'm doing all this stuff for you and no one even cares. Forget it. He could have had that attitude. He could have said it. You might have this attitude, you know, I'm going out and I'm trying to preach the gospel and no one even seems to care. I haven't got, you know, no one's even let me give them the gospel for weeks or something. You know, sometimes that happens up here, but don't let that give you a bad attitude. Don't let that discourage you or get you down. We need to keep going strong and maintain it. Because look, that's the short term. Because in the long run, you're not going to have those results. That's just very short term. A week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Keep going. Keep pushing yourself. Because when you go bearing precious seed, you're doubtless going to come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. That's doubtless. That's, that's the truth. But it's always the short term that tends to, to ruin us and can cause people to make really bad decisions. And it's unfortunate. Sometimes there's really, really, really traumatic events that happen in people's lives that... Um, that, that can really shake a person. But what you do during those times means everything because that could determine the way that the, the course of the rest of your life is going to go. You can give up on God. You can quit. You can just get out completely. Or you can say, I'm going to deal with this and just try to push forward knowing, knowing that in the end there still is a blessing out there that God is still good, that there is going to be. Now, it may not happen today or tomorrow or next week or even next year, but I'm going to keep just putting my, putting my head down, just keeping working and, and just going back and grinding it out and, and doing the work, and I know that in the end there's a reward. I know that God is good. I know that God will, will see my labor and he'll see my heart and he'll see my desire 
and, and my work and reward me for it. Look at verse number 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Because the, the work that we really ought to be focusing on and working for the Lord, we work for the Lord in everything no matter what we do, but we really need to be focusing on working for the Lord in his work. Not the servant of man, but his work, the work of, of leading people to Christ. And this is where you can expect to receive the most rewards from God because that's his, that's his job for you, to be ambassador for Jesus Christ, to go and bring other people to him that his house may be filled. Receive, the Bible says every man, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So the amount of work that you're willing to do, it's going to come back on you for your own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So the Bible is saying you're his husbandry. You're, you're, you're the ox, right? We're the oxen that go forth and do the work and plow for the Lord. He's the master. It's his vineyard. It's his, it's his stuff. We're working for him and, uh, and we're laborers together with God. God is working with us. He wants to use you. According to the grace of God, verse number 10, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." Great reference, judgment seat of Christ. All of our labors, all of our works, everything that you strive for and the things that you endure in this lifetime will all come before the Lord. One day it's all going to be tried. Very clearly, this has nothing to do with our own salvation because the person who didn't do any work for the Lord says they're going to suffer loss because everything that they did is just going to be burned up. It was all meaningless. Any work that they did in this life, they weren't working for the Lord, that gets burned up, yet, yet they're still saved. Yet they're still going to heaven. But we want to have that reward. We ought to want to have that reward. We were talking about before service, you know, our salvation, receiving the free gift, that's the beginning. That starts your eternal life. Let's make the most of that eternal life in our service to the Lord. We're saved by grace, not of works, as any man should boast, but we are created, we are his workmanship created unto good works. We should be doing the works, and if we do do the works, you can flip over to chapter 9 if you, if you real quickly, if we do do the works, he will reward us. Now, we need to remember that God is not a man. You may have only had experience working for men that never really rewarded you appropriately for the work that you did. God's not like that. God, if anything, God, I, I believe, is going to overpay us for the work that we do just because God is so good. Because God is just such a great, awesome God that he sees the work that we do and he's going to, to multiply that unto us. That's what I believe. I, I believe that the work that he does, we're going to be humbled and say, like, I can't believe that, that you know, because we should have the attitude of, hey, it's my reasonable service. I'm just doing, you know, I mean, you paid for my whole soul, so whatever I can do, God, I'm just going to offer up myself a living sacrifice, and I'm just going to serve you, and I don't expect anything in return because you've already given me so much. I just want to be able to serve you and glorify you. That's the attitude we ought to have, but I, I honestly believe this would be the truth is that when we get to heaven and you get to the judgment seat of Christ and whatever works that you've done, it's going to be, wow, I never even thought that this was going to happen. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, you have to turn there. The Bible says, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The same people, all things work together good for them that love God. Well, for them that love him, we can't even imagine 
the things that God has prepared for those that love him. One more source of motivation to, to keep your head up and just, and just keep plowing away and doing the work. Verse number uh, 16, I had you turn to 1 Corinthians 9. It's the last place we'll look at tonight. The Bible says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Again, the attitude we ought to have. Hey, it's, it's, it's my job. It's a necessity. I have to preach the gospel. This is a job that God has given for me to do. I need to do this. Woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe unto me. Verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. He's saying, hey, it's my responsibility, and if I'm willing to do this, and I'm saying, here I am, Lord, send me, I'm going to go out and preach the gospel, I got a reward. But if against my will, dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, but if you choose not to do it, hey, it's still your job, but don't expect a reward now because you're not, you're not actually willing to go out and preach. What is my reward then that verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. We need to make sure we are a people, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, outspoken believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, people that, that, that are separated, that are sanctified, that are set apart, that are not of this world, that, that people should know that you're not of this world, that, that you do believe the Bible, that you do you know, exhibit a life that, that is solely just sold out to serving God, that we are not lazy, that we do not allow negative influences to cause us not to do what God has called us to do, Amen. that we can rise above the challenges, rise above the, the, the persecutions or afflictions or anything else, that, you know, anything that, that could possibly be trying to drag you down, whether it be an employer or a spouse, whoever that's trying to get you not to do what you should be doing, an enemy. We need to be able to rise above that in order to receive our own rewards and to have the most impact and be the most used of God. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great examples that we have in the Bible. Lord, help us. Help us to, you know, we, we can't control the culture of this world, but we can influence the Christian culture. Lord, help us to be a good influence. Help all of us to be a good example unto others that, that we can be viewed as people who, you know, we're working hard. We're going to sweat. We're going to toil. We're going we're gonna to work day and night as the Apostle Paul did in Silas. And they worked day and night and provided for themselves while at the same time preaching your word and doing the work that you have for them, dear Lord. Help us to be able to be examples like that, that we can show people this is how we ought to work for you. And help us, Lord, to be strengthened through all of these examples you've given us to be able to overcome evil with good and that we could take confidence knowing that, hey, if we love you, we know that all things are going to work out for the good for us in the end, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.